Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Jim Spellis. Uh, Jim's is an old friend from the industry, a very, very, very knowledgeable person. Everything tech, AI, we're going to talk about technology, we're going to talk about AI, we're going to talk about how to incorporate AI and uh, should you be afraid or not about AI. And last but not least, we're also going to talk about how he recovered his health at the end of the podcast. Very interesting conversation with Jim Spellis. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meeting podcast. Today, a special guest, a longtime friend, the guy you want to talk to to understand how to use technology, uh, what it does it mean for you as an individual or your company. He's been teaching for 25 years in New York. He's the president of Meeting You, the company that actually is helping you understand technology, feel more comfortable, and, and what to apply and how to use it. Ladies and gentlemen, the legend, Jim Spellis. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time. Until the word the legend, I was all in. But, you know, at that point, I'm, I'm not too sure. You are a legend. There are several in this industry, and uh, you're definitely one of them. And thank you so much uh, for being here today. Uh, first thing first, what is your story? Wow. Yeah. So going back really far, I started out as a child. No, no, I won't go that far back. So <laughs> I got in the industry by accident, in the hospitality industry by accident. And it's like most people, you know, you, you figure out what you're going to do at some point. And I ended up after, after college, I ended up at a physics organization, full-time job, you know, just doing copy editing, basic stuff there. My boss was Dean of Physics at Columbia University, he worked on the Manhattan Project, brilliant, brilliant man. The, and, the Manhattan and, Project with the, the nuclear thing in there? Yep, wow. yep, he's Dean of Nuclear Physics. So he, um, his friends were named Oppenheimer and, and things like that. Oh, wow. So yeah, is a pretty rarefied air. I wasn't even as aware of how significant it was back then. I was just a kid that was doing some copying for physics meetings. And about a year into my time there, he said, we need somebody to handle meetings. He said, now, there's really not much to it. And you exact his, his words. He said, just, you know, look over the files and let me know if you're interested. So look, it was an opportunity. Great. So I took a look and you know, it was conferences, and it was food and beverage, and it was real cool. So I go, great. Yeah, I'd love to do it. He goes, great. Our next meeting's in New York for 1,500 people and you're in charge. And he walked away. <laughs> and um, well, when I stopped crying, I figured, well, I better, I better figure this one out pretty quickly. And luckily had some great support within the umbrella organization of the physics group. And that really started career one, which was the meeting industry where I spent 20 years of my time. But at the same time, this is the same man who gave me the opportunity within meetings. Also, at about that same time, before I was getting swamped with meeting stuff, he said, we have this new thing that I want to put on your desk. I go, what is it? He said, it's called a PC. <laughs> and it was the only one that the organization had. And the reason we got it was because the people who ran the organization knew the people at Bell Labs and IBM and all that. So we got a PC. I go, Dr. Havens, I have, a, I have a word processor here. What do I need a PC for? He said, <laughs> learn it. It's your future. And then, and then on top of that, he gave me a project. He said, okay, we have 100 or 50 years of officers and people within the organization. Figure out how to create a database so we can store all that. Wow. And he literally gave me time at work on a daily basis to work to teach myself DBase, which we were talking about in 1982, and taught myself DBase and said, this is pretty cool. So a few years later, I'm doing meetings and we hired a guy to come in to write a program for registration. And he knew programming, but he didn't know the industry. And the next year, I went up to my boss, same man. I said, is it okay if I take a shot at writing the program? He said, sure. So I wrote the registration program in DBase, and we used that for the other next five or six years I was there. Um, and that started career two, which was teaching and teaching technology. So I became the guy in the industry that people went to. Actually, it was just not me, me and Corbin Ball. Essentially, yes. you know, we, we've run parallel paths over the years. I've known him. We've known each other when we were both meeting planners. So it was really interesting as we watch what we've done. But by that, that's, I, I was actually talk, thinking about uh, Corbin mm -hmm. when I say there's uh, one of the legends. Uh, absolutely. Completely. You know, Corbin is such a great man. 
And he jumped into teaching tech full-time about a year before I did. And I remember when I started my business, the first note I got was from Corbin. He said, congratulations. I'm so glad you jumped in. We need mm -hmm. more people like you to do this. So yeah. talking about class, Absolutely. really amazing. So I, I go back in, and in the 90s, I started teaching at NYU. And I started teaching first their basic meeting planning class and their CMP class. Um, but clearly, I was geeking out on all the technology. And I put together one of their classes for event technology, which essentially was, you know, how to use Microsoft Word and, well, you know, <laughs> what's an overhead projector and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. You're laughing because you remember it, right? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> And so at that point, it just grew. And by the end of the 90s, when I was kind of burnt out with meetings and had some family issues that I was trying to deal with and needed time, it was one of those, what am I going to do if I grow up moments? And I realized, because I was going to teach a friend of mine how to use databases, I said, you know, maybe I want to do this for a living, you know, to teach people. And that was 1999. And so it's now 20, what, 24 years later, I'm still doing it, still having as much fun. Uh, what I'm teaching is different, although I'm still teaching Word and Excel and stuff like that. But it's, it's, it's moved on a little bit from there. And I've watched the industry both embrace technology and push back from technology at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a really interesting phenomenon that we have in hospitality about that because we're a people business. You know, so we love this. We love this conversation. But don't make me do video editing and you know, don't make me figure out if there's an app for that, you know. You know, so it's really been a fascinating approach. And, and during that time, I clearly expanded because I knew what I was doing in the hospitality industry applied to all industries. Yeah, you know? I'm going to kind of come to that because uh, uh, one uh, of the things that you wrote in preparation is that AI will not take your job and AI will take your job to some extent. So we're going to talk about that. But before we go there, I just want to come back one second. You say you plan meetings from the physics department. I mean, the Manhattan Project and things like that, people that, 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 people that were involved in the Manhattan Project, did you have like the FBI and the security and vetting the, 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 the attendees? Because uh, I, I suppose there was like some secret uh, information being shared or not at all? Different game back in the 80s, although there were a few events where we did have Secret Service. You know, was, when we started getting Nobel laureates and stuff like that, clearly it upped the game. But no, these were everyday people. I mean, Dr. Havens was Dean of Physics at Columbia. He ran the American Physical Society. You know, he he wasn't, you know, he was brilliant and understood the need for change and the need to move forward and mm -hmm. really liked more the science side than the organization side. But he was the guy. Nobody else who knew the physics wanted to do what he was doing. So interesting, shall we say, cast of characters on the physics side which always made it for interesting meetings because we knew, you know, if look, look if, if, if the physicist is in a corner reading a big book for two hours, leave him there. He's, he's, he's happy. You know, he's actually reading his abstracts and he's doing what he wants to do here, which is really devour the information. But, mm -hmm. you know, there are a couple of times, you know, when we did one meeting in, in 87, we actually, it was the breaking of superconductivity. And we were front page New York Times and all that. And we set up this meeting and we were working for months on it. And I was working, obviously, with the physics folks who were telling me the importance mm -hmm. of this. And the meeting ended up starting at seven in the evening. We packed the ballroom. We had people sitting on the floor. We were afraid the fire department was going to come in. And at about two in the morning, I finally went upstairs and said, look, they can finish this meeting themselves. <laughs> I got to get some sleep for tomorrow. And when I came back down at five, they were just finishing. Oh, my God. Because they were so absorbed in this. And the next day, front page of the Times, uh, the information on superconductivity. Three first panelists from that evening won the Nobel Prize that year uh, on the discovery. So it was heady stuff to be around. And, you know, when you're in the association model, which is where I was for most of the time I was doing meetings, and especially the scientific association model, it's a different game. It's not events. It's not corporate meetings. It's about content. And you really had to low-key everything else and focus on making sure that the facility location played to what they wanted to do, which was engage with one another and be able to understand what's out there and share their research. Talk about passion, meeting until five o'clock in the morning. Oh, I mean, and, and we would make fun of them and you know, they, they were good-hearted about it because they understood this is 
is do you understand this is a once in a lifetime thing that's happening. Of course, I'm going to stay up till five in the morning, you know, and, and listen to these folks. And everyone wanted to be able to share what they're doing because the you know, science community is a shared language community, yep. you know. So they want to know what other research is going on and who they need to collaborate with. Phenomenal. So Jim, back to to what we were saying uh, a little early on uh, about what you're teaching today and um, about technology. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We are a people industry, and mm -hmm. and we love to interact. Uh, now there's so many. Uh, use of technology, which personally I think is phenomenal, uh, but people are looking at AI now, and yep. you hear everything and the opposite. You hear uh, people saying, "Nah, no problem. Uh, it's uh, improvement. It's going to help us a lot. It's going to help lawyers do research faster. It's going to help doctors find uh, the cure faster and identify the issues." And on the opposite side, you have um, Elon Musk telling you that uh, you're going to have a lot of uh, jobs that are going to be lost, mm -hmm. and obviously a lot of new jobs created. But you also have recently uh, the uh, the head of AI at Google that Google. resigned yeah. uh, because he's afraid. And, uh, and people like him, people like Elon Musk are, are uh, kind of saying, hold on, uh, we need to pause this. What should we be thinking about all, all, all that's going on now? All of it. We should be embracing everything we're hearing. Look, technology isn't good. Technology isn't bad. It is. Mm -hmm. It's a tool. So like anything else, how the tool is used is going to define what people think about it. And you had indicated really where we are on both sides of that ledger. On the positive side, you see what's happening in medical research and in science and be able to really, really you know, understand and identify so much information, so much more than the human brain can actually capture. And what can be done with that is amazing. And on the negative side, you know, you have a tool that could very much sway people in terms of what they believe. Look, we are at heart not intelligent beings. Mm -hmm. We are at heart storytellers. And we love a good story. And we're engaged with that. And we listen to that. And what's happening right now is the storytelling side of this conversation is that this is going to damage humanity. And I can't just discount that, Eric, because there are uses for bad. I, let's bring it back 15 years to social media. I remember talking about Twitter in 2008, I think it was, and being completely over the moon about how great this is. And at that point, I really didn't think that it would be co-opted by people with a negative message because you think about it from your perspective. Mm -hmm. you know. But at the same time, Twitter's done some amazing things in creating awareness and freedom around the world, or at least pushing for that. So I kind of always believe with the technology that mm -hmm. it plays in the middle. So will people not lose their job? Yeah, they won't lose their job if, if they're aware of how their job's going to change. Will jobs be lost? Sure. And as you indicated, jobs will be gained. You know, And the fact that if we just look at ChatGPT right now, and that's obviously where this conversation is going to go at some point, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's not sentient. It doesn't understand anything with emotion. But it can process information at such an amazing rate that we can feel like we're having a conversation with another being. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we're going to believe that more. I mean, I think one of the fears right now in the tech world is in Google shoes, because I think Google is going to lose their dominance in the marketplace significantly over the next year or two. And, you know, I was always talking about 10 years ago, you know, when does Google slip from that mantle now? Because people will understand that using AI and using properly trained AI, and boy, that's that's a kettle to deal with at this point, it can be more valuable. you know. But what's going to happen? Let's, let's look at the future. It's going to be commercialized. It's going to be marketed and commoditized somehow. Companies are going to want to make money out of this. I see AI going into an internal approach within an organization. Let's face it. If I was in a medical, if I was in a hospital right now, I wouldn't want to put anything out there in AI because you, where's it going to go? But if I can create, based on all the information that we have there, an internal AI that scrapes all this information and could be used for the good of the patients, that's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You know, So I think we have to get away from that knee-jerk reaction of thinking it's all good or all bad. And right. when I do my talks right now, it's technology is not going to take your job. And then once I finish proselytizing on that, I say, get over it. It already took your job. <laughs> but in that approach, it changed it. <clears throat> and it. I think our industry isn't, I, mean, I don't think I know our industry isn't ready for that. 
and can't even grasp how it's going to change it because the tech is so new. You know, yeah. it's so immature at this point. You know, what's going to happen with this space development when you can have AI create a whole space? What's going to happen when other technologies integrate? You know, 3D printing, you know, will that change? You know, food preparation, delivery, eliminate waste. I mean, there's, there's so many little parts to it, but at a very basic level, everyone in our industry should be embracing what it is for what it might be able to do mm -hmm. and then make the decisions on their own. Is it worth it? Is it not? I mean, this past week, and I was diving into about 50 different AI tools just because I'm a geek and I do things like that, you know, and, and it's fun when you start seeing video editing and you start seeing third party tools that are using these services. So, you know, look, I, I look at it that the hotel side has been using AI for years. They understand how it can chunk out the huge data they have and really get a better idea of the customer. I don't think the meeting side has used it anywhere near as much. Mm. And I think that's where the commoditization of AI is going to help because now it's on, the, on their desktop. Now, as long as they're not terrified by it or if they know how to use it properly and how to ask the questions, that's where it's going to be a value. I mean, shoot, I mean, I, I sent you a huge list of answered questions, but I could have just put into chat GBT and said, you know, this guy wants me to answer these questions. Can you do it for me? And the chat GPT probably would have done almost as good a job as I did. Maybe better. You never know. Maybe you did. I don't know. You don't know. Yeah, that's right. I'm not telling either. <laughs> no, the way you say, well, ask Eric. That it's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I, was, I was listening to what you're saying and, and uh, obviously the beginning of your career as well. You make me think of maybe a little bit of uh, nuclear technology. On one hand, it can destroy the world. And I remember what Einstein was saying afterwards, yep. uh, after the, the, uh, the, the bomb and how they use it. And on the other hand, uh, I know that it's been used to cure some cancer, to do uh, radio elements and, and using it uh, in medicine. I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm totally with you to embrace it. And I love it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, how, how do you read the fact that head of AI for Google resigned? Control, money. I mean, there's a lot of other factors that could okay. come in there. Okay. I think it's, I'm going to say it's directional. Is that he probably has a very strong direction of where this needs to go. And the monetization part of the company is moving it in a slightly different direction at a different speed. Okay. It, that would be consistent mm -hmm. with what we do with business in general. You know, we're mm -hmm. trying to optimize mm -hmm. profit. We're trying to make sure that we can use this tool. Don't want to use it to hurt people. But we want to use it to embrace our bottom line and, you know, profit to shareholders and all that stuff. And I get that. You know, it's almost like it's bring it back to the nuclear analogy. You know, the physicists are purists. They didn't want to do mm. this work, you right. know, to kill people. But they were fascinated by the, by the power of what this could do. And so I believe from their perspective, they understood the repercussions, even though they were a lot of them were kept in the dark about what is actually going to be used for. But Deep down, they knew it, yet they still couldn't not be involved because mm. that's moving society forward. And when you yeah, move society forward in good ways, you move society forward in bad ways. And I think that's the nuance that sometimes we lose in the conversation. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so how do you read uh, for our industry uh, the change that are, that are coming? So if, if you're creating content, obviously, you can use ChatGPT probably to have a draft and then finalize it. You're talking about video editing, talking, you know, all, all this thing that uh, you, you can disturb and all, all those tools that you, you can use. Where do you see the industry going? And for people that are, are in the industry today to remain active uh, and for people who are entering the industry, where to go, what to do, what to think about uh, this new technology in terms of our daily work? Okay, let, let's break it down from where it's going. I think the hotel side got it already. I think large businesses got it because they understand the, the power of AI with data sets and being able to understand the nuance of their customers better. I think that'll just build and do more. Where it's going to impact in the meeting side is still to be determined, but the, a couple of things you already pointed out, I mean, clearly writing, marketing copy, uh, being able to put information out there quickly that you know doesn't take a day and a half to produce you know, a two paragraph uh, write up or a blog post going to change how that's done. Anything being done online, 
uh, in terms of needing audio video editing is going to change. And in fact, I'll tell you a quick story is this weekend, I, I do some work for another organization we might you know talk about later in the plant community. But there was this video file and the woman sent it to me said, can you do anything about this audio? She knows that in the past I was in radio and I, I do audio engineering. And I said, you know, I listened to it and I said, yeah, I, probably not, but I have a thought. And I went to the Adobe website where they have an enhanced audio. And literally in 25 seconds, I took her eight minute piece of video and improved the audio to sound like she had a microphone right on her lapel. I mean, it used noise Whoa. gate and other AI technology stuff that if, if, if I sound crummy at some point, you can just send this whole, whole video, whole audio recording through that. And it'll so clear up the, the audio. Incredible. So organizations utilizing in our industry, podcasts, any sort of video production, any sort of video marketing, you know, you have these tools now that can create content, that can enhance content, that can clear up content. All that stuff's great. I think the bigger picture is going to be when compartmentalized AI, and I'm not sure if that's going to be the ultimate term there, comes into organizations where you can scrape the information about your organization combine it with all the information that's out there and create personalized content. And I, I, I'm going to jump back to that in a second, but I just want to make sure that I'm clear as we're talking about the scraping. One of the real issues we have with AI right now that's problematic is how biased it is. And we have to address that. We have to understand mm. that whatever you put in there, that data set is going to have the same biases that humans have. So we have to really be clear that we're not creating a, a contextual piece that actually further separates society or puts yes. us more in a class system. So we got that has to be on the table. It doesn't mean we don't use it, but it means that we have to keep asking the questions from the organizations that are developing this. You know, are we doing this properly? Are we getting the information that's wide ranging and supportive and not inherently biased? Mm -hmm. With that said, back to how an organization can use it, I'm going to go back to the physics organization. Because when we used to put our matrix together for the sessions, we were doing about 25 to 30 sessions at a time, three times a day, five days a week in the week. So it was like 400, 500 sessions. Imagine the physicist who gets the abstract book at that point, which was about 500 pages big. How do they know what to go to? So AI can certainly create personalized strategies for attendance. Mm. It's like, okay, get the digital copy, put in the keywords of my research, and now all of a sudden comes out the game plan. Wow. This is not perfect, but I think we have to understand that in working with AI, it's not an either or, but an and conversation. It's how it can do its job and how we can make sure it, we bring it to the next level. You know, and that's why people aren't going to lose their jobs because AI is not going to do stuff. It might be able to figure out how to do it faster, but then you might be able to ask a slightly different question to get an even better answer. So I always look at it, and I know we're not visual here, but I look at it that we are at a certain level with our intelligence. AI is higher than us in terms of how it processes information, but the mm -hmm. combination of us and AI is really where it can get stellar. It's mm -hmm. really where we can have incredible amounts of nuance and new information out there. Brilliant. I'm sorry, I was laughing because I just, when you talk about the level of intelligence, of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. I just saw a meme today talking about uh, the salaries of the, the head of the political party in Belgium. And the guy was saying, I just hope that those are the jobs that will be scrapped by artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one can only hope, right? <laughs> Sorry. I don't think AI has those biases, though. <laughs> or they have the same bias as, as now in, in, in no seriousness. I think you made a, a very important point is that uh, it is contextual, but based on, on the information available. So yeah. I have to make sure that we're not continuing to divide society because of, uh, you know, Uh, the, the type of uh, the quality of the information you're putting there. Mm -hmm. When you look at Microsoft that uh, has now included uh, AI into uh, Word, Excel, and uh, PowerPoint, uh, and I'm sure that Google's doing the same. What does that mean in terms of productivity uh, for uh, business owners? Oh my God, it's going to go through the roof. But you need to have somebody who knows how to ask the question. 
And I think that's where this whole process gets bogged down in people's minds that, oh my gosh, you can do all the stuff. What do you need me for? You need you to be able to ask the right question to do what you needed to do. Example. You know, I teach Excel, and that's been my bread and butter for years and years. And I, I joke now with some people saying, I just lost my job, you know, because AI can do it really, really well, but it doesn't do it perfectly. So I'm sitting home one day, you know, my feet up, have my computer there, go, okay, can I write a program? And I knew it can, but I go, how would this work? So I asked the question, and it was something like, write me a VBA script, which is what, you know, Excel reads in, that can create and automate the process of a pivot table and be able to put the results out in a sheet. And oh. 20 seconds later, there was the VBA code. Oh. I go, holy, shoot, I can't say that word right. It's a podcast. So <laughs> I go, okay, cut and paste, brought it in there, didn't work. Mm. And I know enough about VBA to be dangerous and not enough to do any serious coding whatsoever. But I, I go, something's wrong here. So I went back and I told ChatGPT, I said, that didn't work. And the answer was, oh, I'm sorry, here's the answer. And now it spit out another bit of code. So I go, great, let me put that in. That actually worked a little better, still didn't work perfectly. So it's imperfect. It, 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 it's but it's, it's learning fast. Well, it's not learning fast. Actually, just the opposite is not learning at all. ChatGPT uh, is from a data set that stopped in 2021, 2021 as yeah. people know. So people think that when you ask ChatGPT a question, it goes to the web. No, never goes to the web. Now, there are extensions, and I'm playing with those too, that can actually do both simultaneously. But for what ChatGB does, it is generative. And if I can explain anything to people who are listening today, it understands that how this works isn't by knowing this, you know, like, like I, I don't know, Karnak the Magnificent from my days watching Johnny Carson as a kid, you know, but it really comes down to what word comes next. Mm. And it knows from what it's learned and the question you asked, what might be the word? So I, I, and I tell people in my sessions, I said, you know, you might have a sentence such as, oh, Joe was waiting in the doctor's office. He, you know, sat on the blank before his exam. For his, for his exam. Thank you. That word. I need a chat GPT for that word too. And the, <laughs> and the blank, and I have people yell out blank in this piece of chair and couch. I go, great. You know, those all would be things that generative AI would pick up, but toilet would work too. And it's not necessarily what you would think for that particular question, mm -hmm. but it would be a proper word within a generative situation. Now, the word elephant wouldn't necessarily be that. So you wouldn't see that, but you're not seeing it thinking. You're mm -hmm. seeing it come up with the next word. And mm -hmm. that's where people don't understand it. And when you don't understand that, you start to panic because you go, how did that know that? How, how can I do anything? Because it only knows what it knows, and it knows it based on word-to-word-to-word -word -to -word basis. So I understand what you're saying, and I understand that it's it's from the data set from 21. It keeps improving. We're learning. Uh, we're also talking about learning AI. Yep. So five years down the road, no more people coding, everything automated, no more people uh, creating content, everything automated? No, not at all. Taking the coding, I mean, right now we're in a shortage of coders anyway. Part of what I'm teaching outside of the AI stuff is the low code tools that are out there, which is not needing to know the code to be able to do things like build apps and stuff like that. But I don't see that this is going to get rid of the coders because you're still going to need quality control. You're still going to need to be able to do nuanced things. You're still going to have to be able to integrate properly. So mm -hmm. what you're going to need now is more, perhaps more of a facilitator of coding than a writer of coding. But let's face it, if, if you've played in the coding space at all, you know that most coders go to GitHub or one of those repositories to get the core coding that's already been written so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. This is just getting it from AI instead of getting it from what other people have posted. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it going away. I, I don't see that people all of a sudden are going to be out of a job. I do think it might narrow the types of jobs and might change the economics of the industry. And that's certainly mm -hmm. a possibility. Within our industry, same thing. It's not, you know, an event designer is not going to lose their job because a AI tool called Versi, which is supposedly coming on the next three to six months, can do AI design work just by a text prompt. Not going to happen. You're not going to see people lose the job. But if you're looking at it for a project for a client and that other client, the other person that's looking can get this done quicker 
and better and more imaginatively using AI than you can, you might lose out on that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So again, not embracing the tool, whether the technological or otherwise, is still the same underlying theme that we have, which is you got to stay up in times with the tools to know what's out there and which ones work and which ones don't. But we got to be in an embracement mode. So we're not going away. Coders aren't going away. I mean, at least not in this decade. And could it happen 20, 30 years from now? Sure. But we'll have other things to deal with at that point mm -hmm. uh, in terms of new systems. But right, I think this is the most exciting time we've seen in tech from a consumer standpoint in 25 or 30 years since since search engines came out. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, going back to business owners and using technology. Mm -hmm. And I see that with the people I, I've been coaching. It's always uh, the same type of things that we want to learn ourselves. We want to be involved ourselves. We want to do things ourselves instead of saying, okay, this has to be, uh, that, that's essential for my business. It has to happen. And who is going to do it? Because I'm not the right person to do that. So where do you draw the line between, oh, I'm, I'm passionate about this. I want to learn more. And let me find the right person to point me in the right direction or the right team to actually deliver what I need for my business. How can an organization ever scale if the business owner is actually doing the day-to-day -day work? Bingo. And that's, a, that's what it comes down to for me. So yeah, you're in this industry, whatever industry it is, you love the, nits, the, the nuts and bolts. The bottom line is by committing to being the owner, you're, you're at another level. You're at the level of trying to raise capital and understand marketing and sales. So you might dabble in it, but you still got to find whether it's internally or externally, the people who can do that. And I think that's not a technological issue, but that's a constant management issue across mm -hmm. every generation that I've been around in business for, is that once it's starting to people at the very top starting to, you know, micromanage that process and go, you should do it that way. And you don't forget to do that. Then A, you're getting pissed off and B, they're not spending their time effectively. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, but they need to know about it. So I, I want to be really clear on that. So the, the, the business owner that understands technology has a huge leg up. And most of them do these days, especially, and I'll say it generationally, if they're mm -hmm. younger than you and I are, Eric. Um, but they know what it can do. And that's, I think, what the core of what the business owner has to get to. They have to know what it can do, the promise, so they can then push their team to figure out how to do it. And then they have to provide the resources for their team, whether it's internal or if they're hiring outside, to give them the time and the money that's needed because they might need to learn it themselves to be able to make that happen. It might be a completely new application that's never been done before. So yeah, you want to find a company that can do it, but they're going to have to do some testing and figure out what works and get it to you and you're not going to like it. So I think part of that is the constant, constant challenge with management which is can you keep your hands off enough mm -hmm. to give that person or people space yet at the same time be involved enough to know what you know and go, yeah, I was thinking of something different, you know, do it in this direction. I know that chat GBD can do this. Can, can you do that? You know, so they got to know it. They got to be aware, but get, get your hands out. It's understanding um, where the, their business can go thanks to technology. Yep. Uh, without then uh, figuring out the detail and having the right people to do that. It's, it's like Elon Musk uh, and SpaceX. I mean, the yep. guy is not a, a space engineer, but he came with the idea of uh, reusable uh, rockets and things yep. like that and, and got people doing it, right? And got out, you know, be, uh, yeah. essentially, you know, he's, he's, an, he's a serial entrepreneur at that point, which, you know, many entrepreneurs are, and they want to be able to create and then move on. Mm -hmm. But I do think that within the, the business owner mentality, you know, you have to know more about technology and you think, and then you have to really ask that question. I mean, you have kids. If you had a technology you're looking at, you'd ask your 17 year old to say, does this make sense? Is this easy to use? Because yeah. you're going to get a lot more information than you might get it internally from your own organization. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jim, I, I always love listening to you and the, the, the passion and uh, the concrete ideas that you have. It's not fluffy. It's con I, I love that. I love the it, it's something that uh, not only I can understand, and if I can understand, anybody can, but also it's applicable and, and gives good direction. Uh, and as most people, you also have a passion. And uh, I just want to take the last five minutes just to, to talk about that passion, which mm -hmm. I had no idea 
uh, and, and you alluded to it uh, a little earlier on, mm -hmm. and maybe you can bring technology and AI into that as well. Uh, you have a diploma from Cornell and has nothing to do with meetings and events. Certificate, not a diploma. I'll, Certificate, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll be clear. And by the way, um, ChatGPT wrote my entire monologue today, just so you know. So, <laughs> so you know, so people in this industry may or may not know, but I had a couple of major health issues uh, in the past seven years. And what has happened to me, you know, in the process of reversing heart disease and losing 120 pounds and uh, reversing the pre-diabetes is that I found through the science and through the information that's out there, the importance of a plant-based lifestyle and plant-based diet, as well as, you know, proper lifestyle approaches, reducing stress and being able to get enough sleep and the importance of all that and how it has it on our system. So during the past couple of years, especially, I've really dived all in, in the plant-based community. Um, I support right now the plant-powered Metro New York folks here. I do presentations on my story. In fact, tonight we're doing our first Jewish veg jumpstart. It's with the collaboration with the Jewish veg community. Oy. We have about 50 people who are part of the 21-day jumpstart where they're going to learn about not only the health benefits of a plant-based lifestyle, but societal and climate and everything. And we're going to give them all the resources. We're going to give them the science. We're going to give them the stories. We're going to give them the mentorship that they need so that they can be part of this and then move on from this and you know, bring it into their own lives, however they might, whether they go fully plant-based, whether they just add more healthy foods to their lifestyle. Part of what's out there, and this clearly plays in technology, is all the noise and misinformation that's out there that mm -hmm. people are getting about what truly is healthy eating. But the science is clear. The science doesn't doesn't deviate unless you try to spin it, which everyone tries to do with, with, with data. But what I want to do, and I'm in my mid-60s right now, so you know, I'll be teaching technology as long as someone wants to bring me into their organization. I love doing it. But I also want to be talking to people about healthy lifestyle and healthy eating and why it's so important and mm -hmm. get them to a point where they didn't get to where I got, which is all of a sudden lying on the streets of Queens, not being able to get up, having to get an ambulance to take me to the emergency room to give me a medication that had an instantaneous 5% chance of killing me if it didn't work properly in my body. You learn a lot about yourself when you're in that situation. Mm -hmm. So to me, combining now the tech with the information about health, so I created this app and by the way, that's all part of the tech training because it's all low code. So remember, I'm not a coder, but I know enough to be dangerous. And if you know Google Sheets or Excel, you can write your own apps right now that have about 95% of the power than a non-web-based app would. So I would run with 400. Well, I didn't. I didn't. I put the tech behind it and the team worked together to get a recipe app that had 400 recipes, completely plant-based, completely what they call SOS-free, salt, oil, sugar-free to allow people to still love their food, which we all do, but do so in a way that loves them back. So did that, yeah. you know, and to me, again, it, you know, look, I, I know we are a like-minded here. It's all about a passion play. It's all about doing what we love to do. Yeah. And yeah. whether it's one thing or four things or 20 things, if we can bring them all together, it's going to make for a really rich, really enjoyable life. Absolutely. Jim, thank you so much. I love your passion, everything you, you share with us today. Um, how could people get in touch with you? Through the usual channels, my uh, website is meeting hyphen the letter U dot com. The hyphen is because if I didn't use the hyphen, it was taken by a dating service in Alabama. So I figured the hyphen would be a really good idea. <laughs> so meeting hyphen U, you can find me on the socials, usually either using meeting hyphen U or just the letter J last name Spellos uh, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter. I tend to play a lot these days on the social channels providing free tech content, sort of two, three tips a week. And I want people to understand that whatever they are, whether the tip is health-based, whether it's Excel-based, whether it's talking about the newest AI tool, that there are people out there, hopefully like me, that really want to share that with them and give them the opportunity to understand and improve their knowledge base. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Jim Spellers. Jim, thank you so much. Eric, my pleasure. Thank you for having me.
Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I love your enthusiasm and the way you look at the world, at technology and health. That's absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to connect with me, go on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn or join the Facebook group eventbusinessformula.com slash group. And if you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your network. Thank you. Goodbye.